There is something in the main landscape that speaks of order, that beneath that blanket of cloud and fog, it is nature that thrives and prevails, the contrivances of man, merely temporary annoyances. Consider, however, in the midst of this fortress of consistency, the small, improbable town of Surrey, where one finds ticket offices and well-dressed crowds and damp, unheated barns filled with grand pianos, all in tune. This fight against expectation is led by a gentleman farmer and Sawyer with an extraordinary set of credentials. His name is Walter Nowak. He is said to be the first Westerner ever to achieve Zen mastery. He is a graduate of the Juilliard School of Music and, since 1984, founder, conductor, and landlord for the world-traveled Surrey Opera Company. All right, that spot we got to work on a little, right? It's one of the uh, uh, richest things that I've ever uh, come upon in my experience in, with music and with people. Many of these people have not had any, any training in classical music and their interest to do it over and over again and to perfect it and to understand it more is just is astounding to me. Remember, in this course, there's one portion that's difficult. They're fishermen, there are doctors, veterinarians, housewives, children, all kinds of people. Anyone that wants to sing with us is, is in our group. I'm Claude Dupuis. I sing in the Surrey Opera Company. And today I'm not singing, I'm running a portable sawmill. The only singing I had done was in a rock band. And that was a part-time kind of weekend thing, you know, when I was 19, 20 years old. My name is Margaret Baldwin, and I teach art at our public school here in Surrey. These are from the uh, Boris Gudenov, the opera. It was a wonderful day into the whole history and the whole stylized aspect of the Russian art. Any little heartbeats, Doctor? I'm Dr. Joan Rayton. Uh, I'm a veterinarian. And I've been singing alto, but I'm switching over to tenor. <laughs> it's um, a conscious effort to reach out to other people. The governments are not able to do that, and I think we need to do it on a one-to-one -one basis. The goal of the company is to use the international language of music to convey the larger message of peace and understanding. It was the group's Russian tour last fall that first attracted international attention. Through determination, goodwill, and good fortune, the company was able to accomplish something larger counterparts from San Francisco to Boston could not, to raise enough money and support for a Soviet concert tour. They were so open to what we had done with their music, their opera, and it opened up so many wonderful uh, new things for us and hopefully for them. If you have an interest to raise your voice and make it into one sound with your, your neighbor, and then if you have to divide and share different tones, you're instantly in harmony. And this is what people have to learn, to live together. And if we can take that little lesson from just singing two tones together and bringing it in our daily life, we've learned something. Three, four. Good. Rehearsals have begun for a second trip to Russia this November. The company hopes to learn Boris Gudunov well enough to impress audiences in Moscow and Leningrad. Performances are, of course, regularly held in Surrey in the barn. And the talk is, soon, the Russians may come to Maine. I said to some of the musicians in the Soviet Union that, you know, it's a barn, you, you should come and sing at the Metropolitan. And these people said, no, we have heard your music and we want to come to Surrey. Fame has, of course, finally come to the company. Trips to Russia are not often overlooked by network and print. But for those who feel a trip to Surrey might yield unparalleled virtuosity, heed the words of Walter Nowak, woodcutter, conductor, master of Zen. It's only what we can do, you know. Sometimes they're 50, sometimes they're 70, and sometimes they're 100. It's, but that's what it is, so I can't promise you anything for tonight's performance.
After the performance was over and the lights were turned off and the camera put away, the crew was invited by the group to a post-performance celebration. And as everybody was sitting around talking about people and politics and having a peculiar drink of vodka and papaya juice, the thought occurred to the crew that these people really do make wonderful ambassadors. And then it's not surprising that the Russian people could relate more easily to them than waistcoated diplomats. They were, after all, speaking a universal language. Perhaps it's an idea whose time will come. Coming up next, the president.